Welcome to FACT's webinar called Direct Marketing Meat, the Logistics of Meat Processing. Our presenter is Rebecca Thistlethwaite of the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating the webinar today. Thank you all for joining us. So to begin, a few uh, very brief introductions. FACT is a national nonprofit organization that's headquartered in Illinois. We promote the safe and humane production of meat, milk, and eggs. I direct uh, FACT's Humane Farming Program, which provides a number of opportunities for livestock and poultry farmers. And this webinar is part of our Humane Farming webinar series. Please visit our website to learn more about all of our farmer services, including many of the webinars that we have coming up later this winter. So at this time, I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Rebecca Thistlethwaite. Thistlethwaite, excuse me. Rebecca is the program manager at the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network, which is based out of Oregon State University. She's raised pastured poultry and livestock, and is also the author of two books on farming: Farms with a Future, Creating and Growing a Sustainable Farm Business, and the new livestock farmer, the business of raising and selling ethical meats. We're honored to have Rebecca join us today to share her experience and expertise about direct marketing of meats. She'll be available to answer your questions later on in the webinar. So with that, I'm going to hand the virtual mic over to Rebecca so that me, she may get started with her presentation. Rebecca, please take it away. All right. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, all right, so the topics that I'm going to try to touch on today, uh, there's a lot to cover in an hour, um, and I am only going to be scratching the surface, uh, but we're going to talk about slaughter logistics, uh, a bit about regulations and the difference between inspected and non-inspected meat. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, affect meat quality and meat flavor. Uh, how to communicate with your processor and provide clear cutting instructions, packaging and labing, labeling considerations, transport and cold storage, markets and marketing, and also pricing and cost. Um, if you want to delve into any of these topics in any more detail, uh, the latest book that I wrote, the new live star chapter on each one of these items where I really get into the, the weeds, but today we will just give it sort of a, um, a, a basic glance. Um, okay, so starting off, so today's webinar is really talking about everything from loading up that animal for slaughter all the way to getting to the consumer's plate. So we are not gonna be discussing uh, aspects of production so much. Um, I'm sure that FACT has some great webinars on that, and there's a lot of other great resources out there about um, production. But uh, pretty much once once you are ready to um, take that animal to slaughter, that's what we're going to discuss. So first of all, um, I think anyone who is selling uh, animals for meat should know the regulations as much as possible, and ideally more than uh, the state regulators. Um, I think it's a good idea to keep copies of them in a binder and maybe just keep it in your truck at all times. <laughs> um, it's a good idea to find your slaughterhouse and schedule about six to 12 months in advance. And one of the best ways to find a, a slaughterhouse is um, the USDA Food Safety Inspection Service has a entry inspection. Um, directory on their website and you can search by state and you can also search by activity. So if you need a certain type of processing, say it's uh, poultry processing, you can search by that activity. If you need to find red meat processing, you can also search by that activity and narrow it down to your state. Uh, or if you are near state lines, um, narrow it down to you know your region, other nearby states, and then start making phone calls. Um, it may take half a dozen to a dozen phone calls to find a facility, um, but they are out there and you're gonna need to schedule well in advance. This can be really challenging for newbies when they don't really know how many months it's gonna take to 
get their animal to slaughter, but as as close as possible, as much as you can, um, their date well in advance. Um, it's always a good idea to have a backup slaughterhouse too, uh, plan A and maybe plan C slaughterhouse so that if for some reason the slaughterhouse that you scheduled with is shut down for some reason um, and they do get shut down quite often if they have any sort of um, minor humane handling problem uh, they can be shut down for you know days up to a week and so it may be a good idea to have a backup plan um, and to even make a backup um, uh, appointment and if you do make a backup appointment, make sure that you call them if you know that you're not going to be using their facility. Um, it's a good idea to low stress sorting and loading setup. Uh, don't wait until the night before your slaughter date to figure out how your animals should actually practice with your animals um, well before uh, their slaughter date and get them used to being the sorting pens or whatever sort of handling infrastructure that you've set up um, and let them hang out in those like actually um, let them investigate them and put some feet in there and um, uh, give them to check out your sorting um, pens before the actual night of loading them up. Uh, same thing with your trailer, whatever type of trailer setup or vehicle that you're going to put them in. Uh, it's a good idea to let your animals um, investigate out those spaces um, before the night you're going to load them up. So we would actually, when we used to raise pigs, we would put bedding in there and feed and water and open up the door and let them check it out and go in and out as they pleased um, before their slaughter date. So they'd be really nice and comfortable with the space. Um, make sure that you have a proper vehicle and trailer um, before you take them to slaughter. And uh, don't again, don't wait until the last minute to try to figure out that situation. Um, if you don't have a proper vehicle that can haul the number of animals that you need to take in, uh, a lot of times slaughterhouses will uh, contract or work with tra transportation companies, or they'll know a list of names that, that can provide transportation. So um, for who they recommend. Um, in terms of scheduling the drive, uh, I think that um, ideally you go at night or when the weather is cool and when there's not a lot of traffic on the road so that the animals are uh, on the road for the least amount of time possible. Um, we used to like to drive our animals at night and we'd put bedding in the trailer so they actually just slept. Drive. Um, it was not stressful for them. Um, I know in terms of uh, animal welfare approved, and they don't want the animals to be um, driven for more than eight hours. Um, so if, I, if you can find a slaughterhouse closer than that, that's ideal, but it's not always an option. Um, the animals that you load up for slaughter obviously should be in healthy condition. Um, if you have any sick, uh, dying or diseased animals, don't take them to the slaughterhouse, kill them on the farm and use them for pet food or personal consumption. But please don't ever bring suspect animals to the slaughterhouse because they will be rejected. And it could also um, put the slaughterhouse in a precarious position, um, having uh, sick animals at their facility as well. Try to make sure the animals as clean as possible. I know that during the mud, and that's not always possible, but um, try to put them in with clean bedding and get them as clean as possible. If you are bringing in sheep and goats, um, or particularly sheep, it's nice to have them shorn before you bring them in so they're not caked with mud and manure. Um, and then the animal obviously should be ready for slaughter. It should be the ideal harvest weight. Um, not over by too much and not under. It should be well fleshed out and it should be on the gain. And I'm not going to talk about how you can tell if your animal's ready for harvest, but I know Cornell University and a few other um, 
universities have some great YouTube videos on how to tell when your animal's ready for slaughter. If you don't have a scale or a way to figure out if they are ill weight or not. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end so that way you don't forget them. All right. So since I discussed know the regulations, I should probably explain the regulations a little bit. Um, so there's basically two ways to sell meat and that's what's called custom exempt and USDA state inspected. So it's it's the difference between having inspected meat and not inspected meat. So custom exempt facilities, you know, small um, state licensed butcher shops and slaughterhouses, and sometimes they're mobile as well. Um, you know, they're often the places that process wild game. Um, and you can find these kind of facilities all over the country. With exempt sales, you can only sell the animal to the customer while it is alive. Uh, you are not selling meat to the customer. You are selling a live animal, either the whole animal or a portion of that animal. Um, there is no rules uh, at the federal level about how many customers you can sell that to. So, you know, you could probably break a beef down to eight or 10 customers without um, too much trouble. Um, if you are going to um, break an animal down to that few, it's probably wise to sell them what are called mixed, mixed quarters or mixed eights. So they're not actually just getting... Um, but again, the customer is buying a animal or a portion of that animal while the animal is alive. Um, there, you can't do any wholesaling this way. You can't sell at markets. You can't sell to restaurants. You can't cross state lines. Um, you have very limited options on uh, where that meat can go. And again, you are not selling the meat um, for meat and I'm USDA and state and state are essentially equivalent with one major difference. USDA inspected meat can cross state lines and it can also be sold across internationally. State inspected meat um, can be sold to all different outlets within it, but it can't cross state lines. And the only exceptions to this are five states that are part of the cooperative interstate shipment program that have been um, certified by the U.S. for meat from those state plants. Two is not a part of that program, then just assume you can't cross states. State inspection is only available in 27 states, and the rest of the country is just, it's just USDA or custom exempt. There's no other option. Um, with with in USDA inspected meat, you can sell it anywhere you want, and it requires uh, a USDA stamp on the carcass label, and the label has to be approved by the USDA. Um, if you're selling state meat, that label has to be approved by your state inspection program. I'm a little bit more into the weeds of reviews here. So if you really want to understand If you really want to understand the custom exempt sales uh, even better, um, and that's again where you're selling the the live animal portion of the live animal, um, you really want to check out this guidance document that was published this year. Food Safety Inspection Service. Um, I'll give you a couple moments to write down the title, and then just go ahead and Google that and read it cover. And this is a perfect example of something you may want to print up and keep around if you are doing um, these kind of uh, This is sort of like your Bible, at least for now, until they change the rules again. <laughs> but I want to point out one specific thing with regard to selling um, custom exempt animals. So Again, you are not selling the carcass and you are not selling meat products from that custom exempt animal. You are selling the live animal. Um, and so therefore, technically, they want you to sell that 
portion of the live animal based on the live weight or the per head price, other quantity pertaining to the live animal. So a lot of people like to sell based on hanging weight when they do is a dead animal. that is a carcass that is not a live animal. And so it, technically you are not following um, the federal law to a T if you sell on the hanging weight. I don't know if anyone's ever gonna come down on you for that, but it is something to be aware of. Um, and then the custom exempt operator can only charge the owner a service fee for the livestock slaughtered or prepared on a custom basis, not for meat food product itself. So you can pass on the cost of the kill fee to the person who purchased the live animal. Um, if it's one person who purchased it, they can pay for the whole kill fee. If it's four people, you can split that kill fee between four people. Um, just under all circumstances, make sure that you are not charging people based on um, the final uh, cut meat and do not build in the cost of the kill fee and the butchering costs into what you charge customers because that looks like you're selling meat and you are not selling meat. So your customers should be paying the kill fee and the butchering fee separately make that as clear as possible to people that they are buying a portion of the live animal. If you want to assi assign that animal a name or a number and have them fill out a contract so that it all looks very legitimate, that's probably a good way to go. Okay, there's one other unique option for selling meat and that's called retail exempt. So the way retail exempt works is the slaughter of the live animal still must be under inspection, either state or federal. And then you being a licensed uh, butcher shop or um, commercial kitchen. Um, and you can sell meat out of that storefront, quote unquote, or you can take that meat to local farmers markets and restaurants. Uh, and you can do all of that butchering without uh, daily inspection by USDA and without developing a HACCP plan. Do to do a limited amount of wholesaling as well. So if you're the type of farmer who really is into butchering and really of your butchering, um, you know, say you have a slaughterhouse that does a fine job with the slaughtering, but you're not enamored with quality of their butchering, this might be an option for you. And I know people who have set up um, retail exempt license uh, commercial kitchens in um, former garages or where they actually rent a commercial kitchen space for a couple days a week and they do the butchering and packaging there and then take it to farmer's markets. So that might be an option for you um, if you're really into the the butchering part of things. And you might be able to um, add a little value as well because it does allow you to do um, some further processing such as curing and um, sausage making and um, you know some other nice uh, products. Okay, so that, that, that was all the red meat rules, I should say. Now for poultry, um, poultry has everything if you're if you're slaughtering more than 20,000 birds a year, it all has to be state or USDA. 3,000 birds a year. There is a federal exemption that allows you to raise and slaughter your own bird. You can use USDA inspection. Um, and that is called Public Law 9492. Um, I should say you all the provisions of the Poultry Products Inspection Act. So it still has to be clean and sanitary and um, you know, held at proper temperatures and all of that. Every state interprets this federal rule differently and you should check out um, our website, uh, nichemeatprocessing.org and we have a guide to state poultry processing regulations that I just updated about two months ago. So it's 
Okay, I got to move on out of regulations because I have a lot to cover. Um, in term, well, back to the poultry processing regulations. Most states have a rule around a thousand birds and a rule for birds, a uh, number of birds between a thousand and twenty thousand. And in general, um, thousand birds and under. In most states, they allow you to have sort of an open air setup, uh, relatively low cost, and um, um, yeah, it doesn't doesn't infrastructure. If you're processing more than that, they usually require some sort of enclosed, um, such as the picture you see below. Okay, moving on, out of regulations. Saver of the meat. Um, management and diet is really number one, and genetics may be number two or three. So, I always suggest people focus first on the management and diet and less on worrying about biased and um, genetics um, or breeding stock because that that usually comes later on after you've gotten management aspect. Um, having a low stress environment and handling will also affect the meat quality. Um, more um, uh, hormones and natural hormones, and it affects the pH of the meat and can lead to either really soft meat or um, really uh, dense, like chewy meat. So have have low and just make that kind of a, a normal way of working with your animals, especially the last 24 hours of their life is really critical you handle them as low stress as possible. I do understand that once they get to the slaughterhouse, they may not have that same low stress environment um, and you can't control that because once the animal get, steps foot onto the USDA property, they become, uh, they no longer are yours and they, under the, they come under the jurisdiction of the facility. And so you can't always control how they handle your animal there. Um, ways I think is to get the animal there right before the time that they're supposed to be slaughtered so that and the slaughter appointment would be at six in the morning so they would basically just get off the trailer and go in from slaughter shoots so there was very limited time hanging out in the handling pen or in the pens waiting to get slaughtered um, make sure you are raising the appropriate species for the climate and vegetation that you have um, on your farm. Um, that'll affect the quality of the animal at slaughter. Um, you know, for some species, you can raise them older and get better uh, intermuscular marbling and more flavorful fat. Um, but in other cases, uh, you could end up with tougher meat. So it really depends on the species. Um, but it's good to experiment and play around with um, with letting them with raising them up longer and seeing equality. Again, uh, low stress slaughtering process. If the slaughterhouse is willing, uh, at times um, to to ask if you can stay and watch them do the slaughter, just so um, one, you know how it's done, but also that they know that you're watching. And so um, you, you can, uh, you know, provide some little bit of oversight there. Making sure that they have proper cooling, uh, walk-in coolers, and then uh, aging cooler and finding out the temperatures they hold them at. and um, uh, before you have any animals processed there, you should try to get a tour and really give a nice sniff test to their coolers. If there's any weird smells in there, that might not be a good sign. Um, and those smells could um, affect your meat, the flavor of your meat. Um, I've known multiple producers that had weird smells on their meat from the aging cooler um, and turned out to that they ended up losing the meat as a result because they couldn't sell it. Give a gifts to the coolers. Um, make sure providing good quality butchering instructions, which we'll get to in the next couple slides, and making sure they leave enough fat 
will also affect the meat quality and then good quality packaging and cold storage. All right. Oh, Rebecca, this is Larissa. I just want to jump in and we've gotten a couple of reports of um, the audio breaking up a bit. Um, and it's usually like the first and last word, just so you know, I don't know if there's a way that um, you can talk right into the mic or something like that, but just so you know. Oh, okay. Um, well, I could uh, call in. Should I do that? Um, if, if, we, if you'd like to take a pause, we could do that. Okay. Why don't okay. we take a okay, so second what, pause Okay. I'll call. Yeah, so switch over to that um, on, the, on the top of your screen. There's those three buttons, those three dots, and it will tell you how to um, switch to phone. So I'll just take a moment here to remind folks that I will be sending out a link to the slides and to um, the recording. So all of those resources that um, with the long titles uh, will be at your fingertips. And I'll also try to send links to them in my follow-up email to you um, later today or tomorrow once this is all once this is all done. So I know um, um, I'll send out a all link right. actually how, right now. Oh, hello, you're back. How, how does this sound? Is that better, everyone? So far, it does it not sound up. like it. Yeah, I guess sometimes. <laughs> okay, good, good. Here we go. All right, sorry about that. Excellent. Um, okay, so again on uh, meat quality, which is not going to be the emphasis of this talk, so I'm just going to barely touch on it. But here's a few slides kind of showing the difference between uh, aging of the meat and how that affects meat quality the feed and the breed. And so the top picture is filet mignon that's been aged between zero to 21 days. And the really dark meat with a little bit of mold on it is the 21 days. Um, feed is the bottom slide of some ribeyes. And that's just the difference between what I call um, sort of de facto or um, laissez-faire grass-fed management, so the ribeyes on the left that are a lot leaner, that would be sort of uh, the cattle that are just thrown out on pasture without a lot of thought and um, without trying to finish the animal on the gain for the last 60 days of its life. And then the ribeye on the right is um, well marbled grass fed beef that uh, where the managers of that ranch really focused on moving the animals frequently and making sure they were on high quality forage um, for the last few months of their life. And then the pork shoulder on the right is an instance of, of how breed really affects meat quality, and that is American guinea hog. Um, that's after taking off a couple inches of fat. <laughs> um, but you can see the phenomenal intermuscular marbling. Um, this is breed mixed with feed because this thing, uh, these pigs finished on acorns exclusively. Um, so had really great marbling. So those are just a few, few different slides of how aging feed and breed really affect meat quality. But if you are selling meat, you really need to think about the quality of the meat and that should be one of your main missions is to always be improving meat quality. Okay, so let's move on to yields. Um, depending on the species that you raise, you are going to get a different um, percent yield, and that is really going to affect your um, uh, your profitability. And it also um, helps you understand just what happens to the meat when it goes to the processor. So this way. If you take an animal into the processor, you don't need to accuse them of stealing your meat because you will know that the starting weight, the starting live weight, the hot hanging weight, and then the, the final cut yield is all going to be significantly different. Um, so say your beef animal starts at 1,000 pounds, you're only going to get about 434 pounds of boneless um, cuts with trim out of that, and that is just 43% of the original live weight, so not all that great. Um, most of it is, you know, the um, the, the stomachs and the, um, the offal. 
um, the rumen, excuse me. Um, lamb is even worse. It's about 35% final yield. Goat is even worse at 30, a little bit over 33%. Pig, um, it has the best yield. And uh, we, when we used to raise pigs commercially, we raised about 300 pigs a year and we were able to get it up to 70% final yield um, by working very, very closely with our butchers and making sure that we ask for all the parts back. And then chicken and turkey, if you cut up them, um, there is quite a loss. But um, if you are doing cut up chicken and turkey, you should consider um, using the bones in the backs to make stock or some other products so that you're not missing out on all of that value. Okay, so working with your processor. Again, like I said before, try to tour the facility first. Um, if the processor is against giving you a tour, that's not the processor you want to work with. Um, they should be eager to work with you, and um, if they're not, then you're not going to have a great experience with them. So try to get on a first-name basis with the owner and the key staff. Provide clear cutting instructions at drop-off. Do not ever think that you can drop off live animals and then give them a call a few days later or a week later and provide them cutting instructions then. One is because it's often hard to get them on the phone because they're busy. Um, but two, in some cases, they need to cut that animal up within 48 hours of slaughter. And if you wait a week before you give them cutting instructions, they will probably have already cut it up. And you're just going to have to deal with however they cut it up. So make sure you provide them clear instructions at the beginning. It's a good idea when you first start working with a processor to maybe sit down um, when you get that tour and sit down and have a meeting and talk about cutting instructions and talk about how you typically like to have your animals cut and maybe ask for some of their advice because they've been doing it for a long time. Um, they may know better than you um, how to maximize the yield from that animal and also what sells well and what doesn't. So um, um, don't assume that they don't know what they're doing. They, they probably know more than you. So um, ask, ask them for their advice. Um, I know a, a rancher who works with a processor, a new processor, asked for their advice and was able to actually increase their yields by 8% on their carcasses because their butcher told them a different way to get it cut and they made more money on their animals as a result. Um, clear, respectful, timely communication. Um, Find out how they like to communicate. Is it by phone? Is it by email? Is it by fax? Is it by text? Get, get that really clear, um, how they prefer to communicate and what the best way to get a hold of them is. And then you, it's really important that you are reliable as the farmer, that you show up on the right date with the right number of the animals, that you pay them on time, all of that. And really just understand your interdependence. They rely on you and you rely on them and it's a relationship you want to sustain. Um, when you provide them cutting instructions, you need to be clear if you are going to age the animal. Uh, with beef, um, typically processors will age somewhere between 7 to 21 days. Um, 14 seems to be the real sweet spot in terms of um, getting, uh, um, uh, improving the, the quality of the meat without uh, losing too much yield. And then goats, lambs, and pigs don't need to be aged, but they can be aged up to about a week. Um, so if it takes your processor a week before it gets around to your pigs, don't freak out. Um, pigs actually can probably go even longer than that because they have such good fat cover. Um, make sure if you want to make the most money per animal, um, you have to give them cutting instructions and, and clear instructions on getting all of the parts back. So if you forget to ask them for the head back or the tongues or, or the offal or the feet, um, whatever, the tails, the, the ox tail, um, then that's your loss. And um, they're going to sell those parts for other, other purposes. Um, so if you want those things back, if you think you have a market for them, then you need to ask for them back. Um, sometimes you have to pay for them to, to get them back, like the heads, because they um, often get a, uh, they sell them, and that's part of how they make their money. So you may have to actually pay to get parts of your animals back, which seems weird, but that's just how it works. If you want the hides back, um, you also will 
sometimes you need to pay for that and you will often need to pick them up immediately, like within 24 hours of slaughter because they don't have, usually most slaughterhouses don't have any capacity to store hides and they go bad really quickly. So if you have a market for hides, then, then you're gonna have to get back there and pick those hides up immediately. It's important that you understand customer preferences on how to have those animals cut up. So do your customers like big roasts? Do they like small roasts? Do they prefer ground to roasts? Uh, what time of the year is it? Uh, nobody eats roasts in the summertime, but they do eat a lot of sausage. So maybe you want to have most of your roasting cuts ground into sausage for the summer. Um, also make sure your cut sizes aren't too large. Um, you know, uh, like a double cut pork chop is really nice for eating, but it may be too heavy and too large for most of your customers and they're just not gonna pay for it. Or putting more than a couple chops or steaks in a pack will, will probably hurt you when it comes time to sell it. So you may wanna do single serving packs or just um, two steaks or chops per pack but um, typically not much more than that. And it, again, it depends on who your customers are and what, you know, are they families? Are they single people? What, what are they likely to buy? Um, you can, if you end up having a bunch of stuff cut into a big roast ac accidentally, like say you get your, your pig legs made into hams and nobody, nobody eats them, because if they're processed under USDA, you can take them back to a USDA cut and wrap place and have them repackage them and into something else. So you could always have them grind them um, into sausage later if you mess up and are sitting on a bunch of meat in your freezers. Um, and then think about bone in or boneless. Um, you might as well get paid for the bones. So I, I always suggest people leave bones in as much as possible so that you're not losing out on that value. And then as far as the packaging and labeling, you need to figure out where the meat will be marketed. If you're just selling, you know, custom exempt meat, it can be in, it can be paper wrapped. Um, but if you are going to be selling at farmer's markets or if it's going to be sitting on a retail case, um, um, you may want to think about uh, vacuum sealed or heat, sh heat shrink packaging. And that way people can see the meat. Um, Make sure that the processor does fast freezing, ideally in baskets instead of boxes, because trying to freeze in boxes, sometimes the meat on the inside of the box won't freeze fast enough and you can end up actually having some rot as a result. Um, you get much better airflow if they use baskets. And if this is something that they're not into, um, but you're really into, you can buy baskets for them and put your name on those baskets and, and, and ask them to use these baskets for freezing instead. Um, labeling, if you are going to be um, just selling uh, meat with no claims on it, like you're not gonna need to say, if, if you're not saying grass-fed or hormone-free or any of those kind of claims, you can just go ahead and use a generic label. Um, however, if you if this meat is going to be sitting in a retail case somewhere and it's really important that it has a pretty label that is catching people's eyes and has a lot of claims on it, then um, you're going to have to get uh, that branded label approved by the USDA and that can take um, up to eight weeks to get approved. So make sure you, you apply for that well ahead of time. Um, but if you are going to just stick to the name of your farm with no cute logo or, or label claims, you can get what's called a generic label claim and your processor should be able to um, make that happen for you. Here's a couple of examples of some fancy labels that top, um, top left picture of the beef. That's definitely a retail case package. Very pretty. It's got um, probably a lot of language on there that had to be approved by the USDA. Um, the bottom right is what you would see as custom exempt label. Um, it says not for sale on it, just basic paper wrapped. Um, and then uh, that fancy heat shrunk um, chicken up there on the top would probably be something more for a retail case. Okay, I'm already running out of time here. <laughs> Um, in terms of transport and cold storage, just make sure that 
um, whatever you're transporting your meat in is sanitary. Um, if you're using coolers, make sure you wash them regularly. Try not to break the cold chain. Uh, try to keep things either fresh or frozen the, the entire time. It's good to temperature check and record. Um, even though it's not required by the USDA, it's good to have that just in case um, because you're also regulated by your county and state departments of health and they can always temperature check whenever they feel like it. Um, frozen meat needs to be kept under 32 degrees, ideally closer to zero, and fresh meat needs to be kept at least under 40. Um, if you need to add, if, if you're Say your slaughterhouse is six hours away and you've got to go pick up the meat, um, it might be a good idea to put ice in the coolers or use frozen water bottles um, to keep everything nice and cold. Um, maybe drive at night or when the temperatures are lower. And um, you may need a meat handler's license if you are transporting and storing meat for sale. That is totally dependent on the state. That is not a federal requirement. So you'll have to check in with your own state department of health if you need a meat handler's license. It's usually very simple. Um, if you do have freezers on your property that you're storing meat, they, they'll just come out once a year or maybe once every couple of years and check your freezers um, and make sure that they're clean and sanitary and there's no evidence of um, rodent activity or anything like that. Um, and yeah, okay, I'm gonna just cover like a couple more slides so we can go into questions. Um, in terms of marketing, uh, there's a lot of different ways you can differentiate yourself in the marketplace from kind of the standard meat that you would see in grocery stores. Uh, the, the breed that you raise um, may be a way to differentiate yourself. Uh, having, having older animals or fatter or leaner animals, depending on your customer base, they may be interested in that. Um, obviously, the production method is something that a lot of consumers uh, care about, uh, what you feed them, how you sell them. Are you selling by sides or mixed boxes or uh, by the cut um, or primals and subprimals, say if you're selling to restaurants? And then attributes, uh, the seasonality, are you going to be the beef producer that has beef year-round or only available in the fall? Are you going to have chicken for six months out of the year or 12? Um, all of those things are going to affect, you know, your your customer base and um, how you differentiate yourself. Okay, let's see. And then in terms of different channels to sell to, um, there's different direct sales. So selling bulk, you know, halves, holes, and quarters farmer's markets, a buying club, a CSA, or a farm stand. Um, you can also partner with different groups and do, you know, once a month deliveries or something, like with Weston Price chapters, paleo groups, CrossFit gyms, or other gyms, businesses, and churches. Um, they're selling to restaurants and caterers, um, which can be really challenging because they typically want fresh meat and most of us are, are selling and working with frozen meat. Um, there's also food service, independent retailers and butcher shops um, who, especially whole animal butcher shops, are the best to work with because they will buy your whole animal and figure out what to do with it. And then, you know, if you're scaling up, you can start working with brokers and distributors and branded meat companies. Okay, so my last couple slides are just about pricing. Um, I think it's really important when you are figuring out your pricing, first of all, to know your cost of production, so know how much it costs you to raise that animal. And then take a look at uh, some external pricing. I'm not saying that you should base your price on what other people are ch charging, but it's just a good, good um, way to check yourself and to see if you're somewhat in line with the market. So for grass-fed beef, for example, once a month the USDA produces a report and the latest report showed um, whole carcasses, hanging weight carcasses at 4.27 a pound. Um, look at competitor pricing, so other farmers selling at the market um, or other um, buying clubs. Compute your actual cost of production, add your desired profit margin, figure out hanging weight and retail cut pricing based on all of the above. 
And there's this really awesome meat calculator that Cornell University produced called at that website right there. And it's good for beef, pork, lamb, and goat. And if you know um, your average carcass hanging weight and you know your cost of production, it will tell you, um, it will show you how to adjust your per cut pricing. So here's an example really quickly. So say it takes uh, $1,250 to produce a thousand pound grass fed steer. Um, and I just, these are made up numbers, so I don't know what the actual number is and it's gonna vary by producer. Plus the, so this is assuming that you're selling retail cuts of meat. So plus the cost of the kill fee and the butchering, transport to and from the slaughterhouse, your cost of cold storage and marketing, any overhead and depreciation of equipment. So your total cost per beef is about $2,325. So remember that 1,000 pound grass-fed beef is only producing 434 pounds of finished meat. That would be a break-even price of $5.36 a pound. So say you wanna make 20% profit margin, because um, we're in this to, to run businesses, not to <laughs> run nonprofits. So you have to charge a profit margin. So that would be your average price across that carcass needs to average out to about $6.43 a pound. So obviously a, a big portion of that carcass is going to be ground beef, which might be, you might charge a little bit less than that. And then you're going to have steaks, which you're going to charge considerably more than that. And you'll have ribs and you'll have roasts and all of these other cuts from that animal, but they should average out to about Six forty-three a pound, and that's where that meat calculator on the previous page really comes in handy because it helps you figure out um, how to charge based on every cut of that animal. So that is all I can cover. <laughs> Check out that book if you want to learn more. And it looks like we have about eight minutes for questions. Let's pop into the chat and see what we got here. Um. Yes, thanks so much, Rebecca. And you, <laughs> you can see there's a ton, there have been a, a, quite a few questions that have come in. We have to scroll up and down a little bit because um, there's a lot of other information <laughs> also. Um, yeah. I think there were some. The hanging, in, okay, so Ashley asked, do you know the hanging weight of duck? I do not. Um, but duck usually is somewhere between a chicken and a turkey, um, somewhere between, oh, eight to 10 pounds maybe. The cut yield difference between lamb and mutton. Um, well, once a, my understanding is that once a, a lamb passes about a year, it mostly layers on fat. It doesn't layer on a whole lot more muscle mass. Um, and so I think your, your yield percentage actually goes down the older the animal gets because there's gonna be so much fat that's gonna get cut out of, cut, cut off of that animal, not only external fat, but also um, interior cavity fat. So um, I just bought baskets for my processor. Yay, that's very smart. <laughs> um, I'm looking at on-farm cutting, not slaughtering. Um, so I would suggest looking into retail exempt um, cutting, um, and that would be where your animal gets killed USDA and then you bring the carcass back to um, your on-farm cut room, whether that's a garage or a basement or something that you've turned into a licensed commercial kitchen uh, through your whatever county or state department of health. Um, I know people who have done it for as little as $6,000 because they had an existing um, outbuilding that they converted. Um, interested in learning more about the concept of a buying club so as to use custom processing. Um, that is not, you, it's, you can't really do like a mixed meat buying club um, and follow the rules of custom exempt processing because they are not, I mean, you sort of can, but if they're not buying a portion of a live animal, if you're just, you know, giving them a steak from one animal and a pork chop from another animal and a chicken wing from another animal, that's that's not really, um, that's probably not going to pass muster regulatory <laughs> legally to be a, a portion of a live animal. So um, I don't know what to say there. Um, it's 
you could probably get away with it, but it's not really a way to scale up a meat business. Um, we have a restaurant that's interested in local lamb, but they only want prime cuts. Any advice on how to deal with the other cuts? Um, the local butchers that restaurant deals with does not have a need for non-prime cuts either. Um, well, I would say first off, try to find restaurants and butcher shops that will buy, buy whole animals or sides of animals and work with them to figure out what to do with the non-prime cuts. So. Um, you know, suggest that they make stock, that they make lamb sausage. Um, you know, there's so many. I mean, lamb is almost all prime. There's almost nothing in a lamb that's not a prime cut. So there's very little trim um, in roasts, and they can easily make sausage out of that. I mean, we're talking about 35 pounds of meat on an animal, so that shouldn't be too hard. Um, so buying clubs kind of differ from a CSA in that it's um, – it's mixed meat, um, and so you can do it by uh, the pounds, like you're going to buy, have, offer five pounds a month or 10 pounds a month of mixed cuts. Um, and I've seen people, you know, try to balance out the the boxes or the packages every month by giving them a little bit of roast, a little bit of ground, and a little bit of steaks or chops so that there's always a good variety. Um but other people have added in like, um, you know, the pet food box. So it could be all bones and fat um, or the economy box that could be mostly ground um, and roasts. So you can play it up there. Which USDA AMS report? It's called the grass-fed beef report. You can just Google that and it's monthly. comes out every single month. Best fat ratio for ground goat. That is a great question. I know my preferred ratio for beef is 80% lean to 20% fat, um, but I don't know about for goat. Um, I think because goat can be a little gamey, maybe you want to do slightly less fat because most of the gamey flavor is in the fat of the animal. So maybe experiment between 80 to 90% lean. Um, doop, doop, doop book the name of the book is <laughs> right <laughs> right yeah uh it's 300 pages it's dense um full of information do organic certified meats need to be processed at a particular slaughter facility yes if you are going to sell the meat as certified organic meat the processor has to be certified organic um, it's not that hard for a processor to become certified organic, but very few are willing to do it. Um, and they may charge you a little bit more for certified organic processing. The main difference being they have to use um, different uh, sanitizers and cleaning agents. So um, any advice for small dairies trying to make the most of their veal and coal cows? Um, I think there's a fabulous market for cold cows because uh, ground beef is uh, um, the the main thing that people are consuming beef wise these days ground beef sales represent about 55 percent of all beef sales and so um, if you can process whole cold cows into ground beef and also be able to offer a slightly more affordable ground beef option for people whether it's families or you know schools or institutions um, I think that you would do well there. And then I think uh, rosé veal, so that's, you know, milk-fed veal. Also, there's great opportunity there um, and uh, high-end restaurants and um, uh, more ethnic um, consumers, I think, um, would be really into that. I know a few people doing really well with veal. Um, the key with veal, though, is to not have to pay for a milk replacer because that will kill the economics of raising veal. So I like to, ra I think the best way to raise veal is if you have a, um, a cold cow or a, you know, a cow that um, maybe has a blind teat or something like that, who doesn't make an ideal dairy cow, um, have her job be raising the veal calves. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Um, duck meat, making into sausage. Uh, I think 
duck meat sausage would be fabulous, but it may be a challenge to find a, a processor who will do that because there's not many processors who will process duck because it's um, a real pain in the butt <laughs> to get all the feathers off. There's there's only a handful of duck processors in this country. Um, but you can process duck under that exemption, as I was telling you about, and then um, do the further processing in a commercial kitchen. Um, I mean, we can take about two more questions, Rebecca. Two more questions. Yes. yes. Okay. You know, there's um, a lot of good ones coming in. <laughs> I'm skipping a few. How can veal be considered an ethical meat um, if it's um, raised either on real milk, you know, with with its dam, or with um, fresh milk from, say, a goat or another cow. And then rosé veal is where well, they're also given space to move around. So instead of being raised in a hutch, they're just raised in a um, a very small pasture. So it's just like raising a pig for six months, except you're raising a cow for six months. So same thing. Um, can you process a pig at a USDA plant but use a state plant to cure bacon and still sell outside of the state? No, you can't. Um, if you do a, the cut and wrap in a state plant, it's not it's not going to have a USDA bug on the label, and it won't be able to cross state lines. Um, but you can still sell it within that state. All right, I think that's all I can do. Sorry, I couldn't get through all of them. Um, but thank you all so much for your time and. Um, I'll let Larissa finish yeah. it off. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. That's wonderful. Really fantastic. Um, I do just have a few housekeeping items before we sign off. Uh, just as a reminder, immediately following this webinar, there's going to be a very brief survey. If you would just take a minute or two, it shouldn't take more than that to complete it. Tell us about your experience. We realized there were some audio issues, but um, I think those were fixed. But everything else, anything else that you'd like to share with us? Um, and as I mentioned, a recording of this webinar and the presentation slides will be available very soon. I'm going to email those along with some of the links that appeared throughout the slides um, to you all within the next day or so. Um, please note that we do have quite a few other webinars coming up now in 2019, including several on predator pr protection and a series, a full series for all of you who raise small ruminant animals. Um, we're also currently accepting applications to participate participate in our Humane Farming Mentorship Program for folks who might be interested in that type of learning opportunity. So on that note, I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. A very sincere thank you to you, Rebecca, for your fantastic presentation, for taking the time to answer all of, all of our questions. Um, and thanks to all of you in the audience for your patience, your attendance, your attention, and your interest. I hope that you all have a wonderful afternoon in the very lovely holiday season. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.